Good morning. Thank you very much for being here today uh, and support our um, clinical research. So I'm going to uh, give you a brief summary of immunotherapy um, in the current standards and, and, the, and the future standards for metastatic renal cell carcinoma. So uh, as Dr. Tanir and Dr. Yonash already um, did very, uh, did very um, thorough review of the target therapy and part of the immunotherapy, so I'm going to uh, be able to skip some of the slides. So here is the outline of my talk. Uh, first, I will uh, touch base on traditional immunotherapy, followed by clinical application of uh, immune checkpoint therapy, including anti-CTOA4, anti-PD-1, and anti-PD-L1. Uh, I will also talk about uh, why some of the tumors actually didn't have a response to immune checkpoint therapy, and uh, what's the future like for immune checkpoint therapy. And uh, I will also spend some time on uh, management of immune, immunotherapy-related toxicity, as these immunotherapies are actually um, not totally benign therapies. So why are we interested in immunotherapy? Uh, the short answer is immune system actually can kill tumor cells. However, immunotherapy kill tumor cells in a very different way comparing to uh, the traditional chemotherapy and the new target therapy. First, it's adaptable. So when tumor cells change, the immune system can also change accordingly. Second, it's specific. It's supposed to kill only the tumor cells and spare the, the normal host cells. However, as we know, uh, in this world, nothing is 100% specific. So um, in rare situations, we uh, actually uh, can hit the normal cells as well, and therefore, um, we have to deal with uh, immunotherapy-related toxicities. Uh, third, immunotherapy actually has memory as opposed to the target therapy and the chemotherapy. So once the immune system recognizes the tumor cells, even after the tumor cells um, wake up in three to five years, so uh, the immune system can still recognize uh, these tumor cells and kill them. So for example, um, one of the patients who were treated with ipilimumab has not only survived uh, 11 years now, she also had um, two babies. So. Uh, immunotherapy, there are different strategies for immunotherapy. The, common, the earliest strategy was cytokine therapy, as uh, revealed by both Dr. Tanir and uh, Dr. Uh, Yonash. The second one is called vaccine. The third one is called adopted T-cell transfer. Uh, and the newest one is called immune checkpoint therapy. Uh, so far, only cytokine therapy and immune checkpoint therapy have been used in the clinic. Therefore, that will be the focus of my talk today. So as Dr. Yonash and Dr. Tanir both um, revealed, uh, the cytokine therapy include um, high-dose IL-2 therapy and interferon alpha or interferon beta therapy. So both uh, high-dose IL-2 and the interferon can stimulate the immune system to kill tumor cells. So high-dose IL-2 therapy was developed over 30 years ago. At that time, this was the best thing in the world for uh, renal cell carcinoma. And here is the data on high-dose IL-2 therapy. Um, in patients, um, in over 250 patients treated. So uh, among these 255 patients, only se uh, 17 patients actually had complete response. But these patients actually, most of these patients can actually uh, survive almost over uh, up to 10 years. So basically, these patients uh, are cured. So for those patients who only had partial response, their overall survival, average survival, is about two years. And uh, here are the pros and the cons of uh, high-dose IL-2 therapy. First, it can induce long-term survival. Uh, however, the response rate was very low. The complete response rate was lower than 7%. Uh, the partial response rate was uh, about 8%. So overall, um, over 85% of patients actually didn't benefit from this therapy. Uh, it can also be very toxic. Uh, on average, pa um, some patients can um, basically gain 
pound, uh, 50, 40 to 50 pounds um, over a week of, uh, of time. And many of these patients can develop heart failure, can develop septic shock, and many of them uh, require ICU care. So therefore, this therapy is often limited to healthier patients and younger patients. So interferon alpha has also been tested as a single therapy or in combination with bevacizumab. So the overall response rate for interferon alpha is only about 13%. When combined with bevacizumab, the response rate is about 25%. And the median uh, overall survival can be almost doubled by uh, the combination of interferon alpha and uh, bevacizumab. However, the overall survival did not increase in the combination arm. So the most exciting uh, development, as mentioned by Dr. Tanir and Dr. Yonash, is probably uh, immune checkpoint therapy for renal cell carcinoma and also for many other types of malignancies. So here is how uh, immunotherapy, immune checkpoint therapy work. In order for T cells to be activated for tumor cell killing, uh, we have to have two sets of signals between the antigen-presenting cells and the T cells um, for uh, to be active at the same time. However, uh, the T cell uh, also has a breaking system, it, uh, known as CTOA4, PD1, or PDL1, and uh, many others. What Dr. James Allison found uh, over 20 years ago was if you use antibodies to uh, break this, uh, to take away the, the breaking system, uh, you actually can allow T cells to be persistently activated. Uh, and therefore, this will achieve a better tumor cell killing. So immunotherapy, one of these antibodies is called ipilimumab, was first tested in uh, metastatic melanoma patients. Uh, so these patients, uh, on average, can survive only about a year, even though some of them are very young patients in their 20s or 30s. So if you look at this data, uh, over 20% of these patients can survive uh, almost up to five years. So this was very significant at that time, even though the response rate was very low. It's about 10% in this trial. And uh, this basically, um, um, this drug actually basically gained FDA approval for, for the treatment of metastatic melanoma in 2011. So this is just one of those patients who had complete response. So this patient has not only met, uh, metastasis in the lungs, but also in the brain. And then because of these findings, uh, immunotherapy was regarded as breakthrough of the year by the Science Magazine in uh, 2013. So uh, another antibody, um, immune checkpoint antibody, is called uh, nivolumab, has also been tested in melanoma patients. As you can tell, uh, this drug not only increased uh, the progression's uh, free survival, but also overall survival uh, in melanoma patients. And that was approved by the FDA for melanoma treatment in uh, December 2014. So what about immune, immune checkpoint therapy for um, renal cell carcinoma? Um, Ipilimumab was actually tested in a very small trial for metastatic renal cell carcinoma. This was reported in 2007. So this, um, in this trial, patients were divided into two groups. In the first group, these patients actually received a relatively low dose of uh, ipilimumab. The second group, in the second group, patients received a higher dose of uh, ipilimumab. Uh, it's three milligram per kg. And uh, so in this group, four out of, four, uh, five out of 40 patients, uh, which is about 12.5% of patients, actually had a response. So uh, as Dr. Uh, Tanir summarized very, uh, in very detail, nivolumab has been tested versus uh, Everolimus in advanced renal cell carcinoma. And I don't have to tell you very much about this because he, his slides are actually more detailed um, in my, uh, comparing to mine. So, um, and, uh, but I just want to tell you one of, this, one of my patients who were treated on this trial. So this was a 73-year-old um, lady who has metastatic renal cell carcinoma, initially diagnosed in October 2013. And uh, she uh, got treatment with Voltrin, Oxetinib, and Everolimus for about two years, but eventually uh, had disease progression. At that time, she had constant cough, 
uh, because of the tumors in the lungs. She couldn't eat or drink. Uh, she couldn't even talk very much at that time. She was oxygen dependent uh, and wheelchair bound. So basically at that time, we uh, arranged for uh, home hospice for her. Fortunately, uh, nivolumab was actually approved by the FDA at that time. And uh, she was actually able to be treated uh, with nivolumab uh, um, about a week before the FDA approval of the drug. So just after about three months of therapy, and uh, her tumors almost com were almost completely gone. And then I just saw her last week. She, now she can basically uh, you know, do laundry shopping by herself. So really, this drug can make a huge difference in a patient's life. So um, however, if you look at immune checkpoint therapy for any type of cancer, for melanoma, for lung cancer, for um, renal cell carcinoma, for bladder cancer, the overall response rate is about 25%. <laughs> so the question is, why the other, what about the other 75% of patients? So people have been looking for uh, predictive markers uh, to, you know, to predict clinical response uh, to this immune checkpoint therapy, as Dr. Tanir uh, just mentioned. But so far, uh, nothing has been very successful. So we actually took a different approach. Instead of looking at those 75%, uh, those 25% of patients who responded to therapy, so we actually did some research to look at the 75% of patients who did not respond uh, to immune checkpoint therapy. We feel that if we can figure that out, we have a good chance to not only help the 25% of patients who responded to immune checkpoint therapy, but also help the other 75% of patients. So um, for that purpose, we actually studied uh, patients with melanoma uh, who um, received epilumab therapy. So we studied a, a total of 16 patients. Among the four patients who responded to, epil to, epilum uh, to epilumab, um, so we didn't find, uh, so we found that their tumors had no what's called a genomic defect in the interferon gamma pathway genes, which is a key uh, gene that mediate immune checkpoint therapy. However, in the 12 patients who did not respond to epilumab, seven, uh, nine of these patients actually had um, defect in the interferon gamma pathway genes. So when we expanded this uh, information to the what's called the TCGA database, we, uh, um, we found a total of 200, uh, 267, 367 patients um, with melanoma. So among them, 134 patients actually had uh, what's called copy number alteration, uh, a, a certain uh, genomic defects of the interferon gamma pathway genes. So we found this patient, uh, those patients who had tumor with these gene defects actually survived much shorter comparing to patients who uh, did not have this uh, interferon gamma pathway, signaling pathway defect. So it looks like the tumor interferon gamma pathway gene defect is not only, not only predict um, response to immune checkpoint therapy, but also uh, um, is a poor indicator, a prognostic factor for, um, for overall survival. I'm going to pass through these slides. So in the meantime, another group, uh, Tony Rivers' group, actually found in patients who did not respond to anti-PD-1 or pembrolizumab, uh, they actually develop uh, mutations in key interferon gamma pathway genes. Uh, na uh, named JAK1 and JAK2. So together, it looks like tumor interferon gamma pathway gene defect uh, is actually a common resistance mechanism for patients who do not respond to immune checkpoint therapy, including uh, anti-PD-1 and anti-CDOA4. We also found um, in prostate tumors uh, that that's known to not respond to immune checkpoint therapy very well. So they actually, um, when you treat these patients with ipilimumab, you actually can induce lots of immune cells to get into the tumor cells. However, they actually express very high level of immune checkpoints, such as Vista or, or uh, PDL1. 
So as a result, these patients actually do not respond to immune checkpoint therapy. So with this information, what, um, so we've, we feel that if we can do combination therapy, um, we have maybe have a better chance to not only increase the response rate, but also um, the overall survival of patients. So this graph basically uh, illustrates that concept. For traditional uh, target therapy, you can have higher, relatively higher response rate, but uh, the resistance can develop very fast. With immune checkpoint therapy, you have a relatively low response rate, but have the potential for long-term survival. If we can combine these two type of therapy, maybe we can increase not only response rate, but also long-term survival for, for our patients. So this concept was first tested by Mike Curran in Dr. James Anderson's lab. So what he found was indeed, if you combine this immune checkpoint therapy, you actually can uh, increase the survival of mice bearing uh, different types of tumors. So, um, and uh, there are multiple clinical trials uh, ongoing. Uh, the, the most important one is actually ipilimumab plus um, nivolumab, which is an anti-PD-1 plus anti-CTLF-4 trial. Uh, this is a phase one trial, uh, as mentioned by um, Dr. Tanier as well. So when you combine nivolumab and ipilimumab uh, at different doses, the response rate was uh, about 40%. And also over about 40% uh, of patients actually have stable disease. So overall, you can have about 80% of chance to control these tumors. So a phase three trial currently here is uh, leading by Dr. Tanier uh, with nivolumab versus ipilimumab versus sutin um, is also uh, ongoing. And uh, hopefully, uh, we can see the, the, uh, the data uh, within the next several months, and hopefully this drug uh, combination can be uh, approved by the FDA for um, renal cell carcinoma patients in the future. And uh, another combination is with oxetinib uh, with pembrolizumab, which is another anti-PD-1 uh, antibody, has uh, been ongoing as well. So overall, uh, 52 patients actually have been enrolled. Um, uh, 11 patients actually discontinued therapy because of uh, toxicity. Uh, and other factors. But uh, overall, the response rate, as you can tell, it's 67%, which is very dramatic. Uh, however, the toxicity rate is also quite high. Another combination uh, with evolumab plus oxytonib uh, is also ongoing. Uh, so at uh, this time of the report, uh, there were only six patients treated, but five patients actually had response at that time. Uh, one patient actually had stable disease at four months. So a phase three trial uh, is also ongoing for this, for, uh, this combination study. Um, another combination with atezolizumab with or without bevacizumab uh, versus sutin is also ongoing at this time. <coughs> and uh, it looks like the combination of atezolizumab plus bevacizumab actually can in, uh, increase the overall uh, progression-free survival uh, although the, the, uh, statistically this is not very significant. And it looks like this combination can increase the uh, response rate um, as well as compared uh, as compare to sutin uh, versus uh, atezolizumab as monotherapy or single therapy. So there is uh, uh, another phase one study with pembrolizumab, which is another uh, anti-PD-1 antibody in combination with um, was uh, is also ongoing, but currently we don't have any data. Uh, at MD Anderson, we have what's called a pre-surgical trial um, by, uh, to evaluate either nivolumab versus nivolumab plus bevacizumab or nivolumab plus <coughs> ipilimumab. Uh, this trial is ongoing, uh, but we recently uh, enrolled a, a total of 60 patients. We already reported part of the results at the AACR meeting. Um, so as you can tell, nivolumab alone as monotherapy can have a response rate of 42%, but this is based upon a very small number of patients. When nivolumab is combined with bevacizumab, the response rate is actually uh, 52 to 53%. 
when nivolumab plus ipilum, uh, when nivolumab is combined with ipilumab, uh, so the overall response rate is 38%. Uh, so as far as toxicity, uh, when we look at the grade three or higher toxicity, in the nivolumab alone, it's about 19%. In the nivolumab plus ipilimumab group, the, response, uh, the toxicity rate uh, is 27 percent. But in the bevacizumab plus nivolumab arm, the toxicity rate is 41 percent, which appears to be higher than the other uh, two groups. However, 17 percent of this toxicity was due to known bevacizumab induced hypertension, which is very easy um, to be, uh, which is very easily managed by. Uh, blood pressure medications. Therefore, if you take away uh, this 17% 17, 17 of toxicity, here you have only 24% uh, of grade three or higher toxicity, which is very comparable to the other two groups. So um, currently, uh, there are many clinical trials ongoing for immune checkpoint therapy um, for renal cell carcinoma. Um, so there is, uh, it's, it's almost impossible for me to list all those trials. Therefore, I only uh, want to point out a few trials that's ongoing in, uh, at MD Anderson in our department. So uh, a few of them have already been mentioned by Dr. Tanier, um, um, and also this pre-surgical trial. Um, there is another trial, it's called uh, Tremelumab, which is uh, anti pd l one antibody plus cryoablation that's led by um, Dr. Sharma, uh, Dr. Mateen, and uh, Dr. Kendall. Um, so there is a, a phase three trial with uh, Evolumab plus Oxitinib versus Sutin. Uh, that's led by uh, Dr. Campbell. Um, there is a phase one, uh, wait, one and two study with uh, MGCD, which is a multiple um, tyrosine kinase inhibitor and nivolumab. This is uh, led by uh, Dr. Tanier, uh, as mentioned by Dr. Tanier a moment ago. And uh, plus, there is a nivolumab uh, plus ipilimumab trial uh, in, uh, in the development for renal cell carcinoma uh, by Dr. Tanier, uh, and uh, many other trials in the development at this time. So in addition to this exciting development of immune checkpoint therapy, I want to point out to you guys uh, that immunotherapy is, immune checkpoint therapy is not benign. Uh, it can, uh, it, often it can cause uh, fatal immune-related toxicities. The most deadly toxicity is called pneumonitis. Uh, the second one is, um, pneumonitis is basically inflammation in the lungs. The second one is called uh, colitis, uh, which is inflammation of the colon uh, as manifested by uh, diarrhea, abdominal pain. Uh, and also hepatitis, which is inflammation of the liver, hypophysitis, which is inflammation of the uh, hypopituitary gland, and also uh, dermatitis, which is inflammation uh, of the skin. So I just want to show you uh, a few examples for pneumonitis. Uh, so this is a patient who developed pneumonitis on immune checkpoint therapy. This is the CT scan. As you can tell, uh, there is this inflammation, diffuse inflammation in the lungs. For patients with pneumonitis, often you feel um, some shortness of breath. You can have cough. Sometimes you can cough up blood. Uh, so if that happens, you have to tell your physician immediately, and then you have to come to the emergency room for uh, emergent evaluation. And often you have to be hospitalized for, uh, for di further diagnosis and treatment. So uh, if, this cannot, if this is not handled very well, a patient can uh, lose his or uh, her life within two to three weeks period of time. For uh, colitis, uh, this is basically how the colon looks like uh, with col immune-induced colitis. As you can tell, there is lots of ulcer ulceration in the colon. And uh, on pathology uh, slides, you can see lots of immune cell infiltration. So when a patient develops uh, colitis, often you can have um, profuse diarrhea. 10 to 20 times a day. This is often watery. Sometimes you can have blood in it uh, as well. Uh, you can have abdominal pain. Uh, you can even have fever. So when, uh, if you develop colitis, you have to come to the ER. You have to call your, you know, your doctor, come to the ER for emergent evaluation. Often you will get a CT scan to look at you know, for, um, 
for changes in the colon uh, for perforation, you need to get um, uh, infection workup to rule out some infectious causes such as uh, C. diff, and uh, you will be admitted to the hospital to get not only antibiotics, but possible uh, colonoscopy and also, um, um, and also um, high dose steroid if this is confirmed um, as colitis. For um, people who develop hypophysitis, often they have this inflammation. Um, of the hypopituitary gland on the MRI scan. So when you have hypophysitis, basically all your hormones in your body can be wiped out. So often you feel acute vision change, headache, uh, overall fatigue, your blood pressure can drop to the 70s. So uh, if you don't seek uh, ther uh, treatment immediately, uh, it's very easy for a person to pass out with such low uh, blood pressure. So when that happens, you also need to come to the ER for immediate evaluation. So any, anyway, in summary, uh, so high-dose IL-2 therapy can have long-term survival, but with, with very low response rate and a significant toxicity. Anti-immune uh, checkpoint therapy, uh, such as anti-CTLA-4, uh, anti-PD-1, or uh, anti-PD-L1, can have modest activities against um, renal cell carcinoma, uh, combination therapies including anti-PDL1 plus anti, um, I'm sorry, anti-CTLA4 plus anti-PDL1 or anti-PD1 or target therapy may overcome uh, tumor resistance. However, the toxicity is also uh, very high. It has to be managed in a timely fashion. So thank you very much for your attention.